Thank you. I'm Darren Maloney, a member of the CMC Board of Trustees and a senior vice president with the uh, PNC Commercial Banking Group. It's great to see everyone today. Today's forum, Columbus City Schools School Levy Primer, is sponsored by the Columbus Foundation, represented here today by many of their friends and associates. Won't you please help me thank them and welcome Dr. Lisa Cordice, Executive Vice President at the Columbus Foundation, to introduce our speakers. Lisa? Thank you, Darren. The Columbus Foundation is proud to support the Metropolitan Club, celebrating diversity, discussion, and debate, and where we have convened public conversations on important topics every week for the past 40 years. Today, uh, we are pleased to be the sponsor of this program and recognizing that you value the power and convening of convening and conversation, we want to make certain that you're aware that the Columbus Foundation has launched a new initiative, The Big Table. The Big Table will be held on Tuesday, August 30th, and we encourage your participation. August 30th is going to be a magical day in Central Ohio. Throughout the day, thousands of people will be participating in conversations. Each of these conversations will bring eight to 10 people together for an hour and will be held in homes, businesses, community centers, libraries, restaurants, and parks. Similar to CMC, we believe there is great value in talking together about what we find important and how we can improve our community. There is also great value in listening. We hope you will consider being a host. To date, we have more than 330 people registered to host three times our original goal, which means that on August 30th, more than 3,000 people will be engaged in conversation in our community. Our hosts represent many different areas in our region, including downtown, Linden, Dublin, Upper Arlington, Wyland Park, Franklinton, Driving Park, and Berwick. You will find a flyer on your table. And if you'd like to participate and not, and not necessarily be a host, our library system is one of our partners, and there are many opportunities to be a member of a conversation at the libraries. Please go to our, our website to learn more about this opportunity to register to be a host and to learn about these library opportunities. Today, we are pleased to have the opportunity to hear about and explore Columbus City Schools and the state of our kids as we prepare for the challenge of a November school levy. Please welcome Education Director of the City of Columbus Department of Education, Rhonda Johnson, CEO of the Girl, Boys, Girls and Boys Club of Columbus, Rebecca Asmo, the founding president of kidsohio.org, Mark Reel, and superintendent of Columbus City Schools, Dr. Dan Good. Dan will start us off with opening remarks, and then Mark will host the conversation. Dan. Thank you, Dr. Cordes. And thank you to the Columbus Foundation and to Ice Miller for your sponsorship of today's occasion. I will shamelessly plug the community conversations. If you'd like a unique, highly valid perspective on our community's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, then please join any of the Columbus City School staff. Staff, wave your hands so they know where you are. That's the key to success, buy all the tables at an event where you're speaking. And um, we're happy to host you in conversations with our youth on Tuesday, August 30th. So I woke up this morning, a morning when many of Central Ohio's districts opened their doors to students, and I realized I'm in the middle of my fourth decade of public service. And yet, even after 50 years of learning in this industry, the first days of each new year are still exciting, likely exciting for you as well, because there's an energy across the community, what we call the spirit of success the spirit of Columbus City Schools, and every one of you are a part of it. I know that my colleagues, Andy Boy and Greg Brown of United Schools and Graham Schools are, they and Isabel Toth from Community Properties of Ohio and Bo Chilton from the Impact Community Action and our peers at United Way can tell you that we've all been busy. 
We've been busy guiding families to organizations like Charity Newsies to help meet children's clothing needs and to the back to school rallies hosted by partners like NAACP, thank you Tina Pierce, Pure Elegance, I don't bet you don't know we have libraries in our barber shops now, and Lutheran Social Services, thank you Julie Z Zdenowitz, and other partners such as The Pact, thank you T and Trudy and Fred, all of them collect and distribute school supplies. Our faith leaders, the Reverends Carter, Goff, King, Laws, Little, Peaks, Price, Tatum, Washington, and Wheatley promote that energy at area convocations, their end of summer break picnics, and the educational summits. Patrick Terrian of the Council of World Affairs has been thinking about how to prepare our children to compete in a global economy, and new experiential curricula have been designed by partner Cindy Foley from the Columbus Museum of Art, Diane Custer from the Wexner Center for the Arts, and our friends at COSI. Nationwide Children's Hospital's Jesse Cannon, who exhibits the commitment of a missionary, has been partnering to open eight more nurse practitioner clinics in schools for children and ultimately our families. Lillian Lowry, a future ready Columbus, and Eric Carlack of Action for Children, join pioneers like Jane Abel of Donato's and Hope Shred of the Crane Group and Rhonda Johnson, the city's education director, and others to focus laser-like on how we ensure every Columbus early learner has access to a high quality education. In fact, this fall we open a collaboratively planned Linden Park Early Childhood Education Neighborhood Center. And our mentor partners, Rebecca Asmo of Boys and Girls Clubs, Laura Krause that I know I can, Tasha Booker at City Year, Rick Studer at Columbus Rotary, they're expanding their efforts to connect more near peers to students elementary age through college through college, that's something that's important to Columbus State Community College's Karina Brown and Franklin University's Joanna Williamson and OSU's Mindy Ridgeway. So you see, I could talk about almost every person in this room and how the new year impacts them. My confidants, like Carol Looper, Sandy Harbuck of Paul Worth, Mark Rill of Kids Ohio Council, welcome guidance. And of course, the citizen servant I looked up to as a friend and continue to look up to and a mentor former Mayor Michael Coleman, now Vice Miller, he continues to offer his assistance in any manner and tirelessly serves as a champion for Columbus and its children. This room's collective, their collective will to create pathways to prosperity in what Mayor Ginther calls the Opportunity City is what helped Columbus City Schools move from 42% of our third graders reading on level for promotion to fourth grade to over 92%, not just one year, but now two years in a row. And this is sustained in great part because of the incomparable volunteerism of many of you, particularly OPSI's Lois Carson and Andre Washington, who annually, along with Phil Hayes of CEA, lead a door-to-door -door crusade. It's that collective will of our community that helped us change D's and F's on our state report card to A's and B's. Something that happens because organizations such as Battelle for Kids and the Educational Service Center of Central Ohio and the Thomas B. Fordham Institute research, they research and they promote that demography is not destiny. All children can and all children must learn. And in Columbus City Schools, they do. We are now the Ohio Department of Education's urban model for the identification and service to those with handicapping conditions, 17% of our student body. And we lead the state in supporting our limited English proficient students, over 7,000 students. And we also have created a new model for identifying and serving learners identified as gifted and talented, 16% of our student body. Our career pathways have evolved from woodshop and home economics to high demand, highly technical training in cybersecurity, automotive diagnostics, environmental control, structural engineering, and yes, the advanced art of ink parlor tattooing. Not really, I just wanted to see if you're listening. <laughs> the point is this. The point is this. Our children are graduating with industry certifications in hand, college credits on their transcripts, job offers, and money. This year, over $57 million in scholarships. That's up $15 million from last year. But we've more work to do, because all means all. 92% of third graders eligible for promotion to fourth grade means we have a couple hundred students that are not. A's and B's on the district's report card represent the mean, not the mode of all our buildings. 
We have still a dozen or so schools where significant investments in appropriate pedagogy and relevant resources is required. Through our mentoring program, one of only 10 recognized by the White House, we were able to triple the graduation results in one senior class at one school. But if my child didn't get a diploma, and they're all my child, and they're all our children, that's not good enough. So we're here today to talk about what the Board of Education is asking for in this November ballot. Why? Because we've got trouble right here in Opportunity City. This past Saturday, when the heat index was over 100, I stood at the front line of a line of over 200 people at one of our neighborhood parks back to school bashes. To each family, I posed the question, where do you go to school? And my gut hurt more and more after every sixth family when the response was something like this, we don't know, we're not certain where we'll be living then. Friends, 89% of the children in our city, whether in a district or community school, a private or parochial school, live in economic disadvantage. Nearly 20% of the families I met on Saturday don't even know where they'll be living when the rent comes due at the end of next week. And we know that growing up in such conditions create chemical and neuron circuitry in a young brain that is different from those who do not experience the toxic stress of fear and doubt and uncertainty. The purpose of the board's millage request is to help our community better address the social emotional needs that come to school from home with the addition of licensed school nurses and social workers, instructional assistants and safety and security personnel, specialists in exceptional needs, as well to begin tackling a multi-million dollar backlog of overdue maintenance so that our students can learn in places that are safer and warmer, well maybe not warmer, not now, but drier. <laughs> but these are the kind of investments that are needed and I know that the community of which I'm a proud member wants each and every child to experience that spirit of success, the spirit of Columbus City Schools. And I look forward now to our dialogue on the panel. Thank you, Dr. Good. And uh, <clears throat> I want to <clears throat> jump right in and ask you, since the, the purpose of this is the levy primer, to describe for us uh, <clears throat> what the proposed levy would do. So thank you for the question of what the proposed levy would do. There are 6.9 mills proposed. 5.58 of those mills would raise um, a, a little, a nearly $50 million. And that would be to support the new positions that I described to you. Um, just earlier. So for preschool classroom teachers, for example, we would be adding five classrooms annually with a teacher and an instructional assistant in each of those classrooms. Our goal is to have licensed school nurses in every building. Um, the social workers, we would be increasing. So it's a number of those supports that address the social and emotional needs and the physical safety needs of our children, as well as continuing to build on the successes of our reading programs, expand our early childhood programs, and develop more career pathways. The balance of that request on the levy is to address the backlog of maintenance that I identified. So replacing roofs, we now have 28 buildings who need uh, roof repairs. Nine of those buildings have roofs that are at failure at this point to address asphalt, HVAC needs, to replace technology, upgrade our busing, et cetera. Okay, uh, <clears throat> Rhonda Johnson uh, is the director of the uh, city's Department of Education. There's been a long time commitment to improving early childhood programs. Can you tell us about that and tell us how, do you, how are you working with the school district? Uh, thank you for that question, Mark. Um, we are very proud of the relationship that we have with community-based pre-K providers and also our Columbus City School provider, probably the largest provider of high-quality pre-K in the city. Um, we, uh, we give grants to providers in the city to provide high quality pre-K for those providers that have at least three to five stars. Um, with Columbus City Schools, they all, all the programs have the attributes of a five star high quality program. 
Um, the Ohio Department of Education uh, gives the Columbus City Schools, through a, the Early Childhood Education Grant, $4,000 per child for a half-day program. Well, half-day programs just don't work for our families and kids. And so what the city does is matches that $4,000 to provide a full day of pre-K for children in Columbus City Schools. Also, there are community-based providers that have shared use agreements with Columbus City Schools. So when there are unused classrooms in school buildings, community-based providers can use those classrooms and have pre-K uh, in those classrooms right alongside the teachers in Columbus City Schools. But probably our most significant investment is coming this fall with the opening of the Linden Park Early Childhood Education Center. Um, you know that Mayor Ginther's uh, goal is to um, create more opportunities in the Linden community. Uh, Linden Park Elementary School had been closed for a couple of years. The KIPP program had been in the building, but it, it was the, the ideal place to have a demonstration project of what we can do in early childhood education. We're going to have two community-based providers in the building along with Columbus City Schools teachers. And so this is different from a shared use agreement. They're actually sharing, they're sharing curriculum, they're sharing resources, they're learning from one another. They have common assessments, common professional development, um, all of that to make for uh, what I call utopia in, um, in pre-K. This is something that we have not seen across the country where we have community-based providers working very closely with the Columbus City School District. Uh, we're very excited about that program opening um, uh, this fall. Um, we expect to have four, six classrooms uh, in that building, and we're looking at this as a demonstration model for possible replication um, elsewhere in the city. Rebecca, the, the Girls and Boys Club, uh, tell us, I know most recently during this summer, you give, give the, us a sense of what kind of work have you been doing with the school district? Um, yeah, so uh, what's interesting, we talk a lot about schools, but kids have really just as much time that they spend out of school uh, that they spend in school. Um, so one of the partnerships that we've been very grateful um, to have Columbus City Schools uh, work with us on is a summer school initiative. So. Um, Prior to two or three years ago, uh, when a child needed uh, academic intervention in the summer, they were able to attend summer school for probably about three hours a day. Um, so it's really, I think three years ago, the, the Columbus City Schools started this at one school. Last year, we expanded it to two schools, and this year, we were in five schools. Um, and uh, every single student, elementary school student in Columbus City Schools has access to a full day of summer school program through our partnership. So the schools and their uh, personnel still do the traditional academic intervention um, in the morning, but then club staff come in and operate the program for the balance of the day. Um, and you know, summer is the number one contributor to the academic achievement gap between low-income children and high-income children. And it's also something that when you deliver a comprehensive program, kids from any, you know, from any neighborhood in Columbus meet and beat their peers in high-income neighborhoods. Um, and so it's been really exciting to have um, you know, the school district be so open um, to us, and we've worked together to secure funding and, and make sure that the, the program runs smoothly. Um, but we hope to continue to see that grow. And, and Dr. Good is, has made a commitment that no child will be turned away from that program. So I feel like we are really working towards a, a community that makes sure that every single child has access to learning in the summer. Um, and when we're talking about success in school, um, you know, typically a, a student from a low-income neighborhood will show up three months behind every single school year, three months behind. So when you think about how much work that puts on teachers, and, and really it's unfair to our students who are, are just you know, at a disadvantage um, once they get through school. So this is some really exciting work, and, and, I, and Columbus is one of the first communities to be approaching um, summer learning in this kind of public-private partnership. Dr. Good, there are a number of people here who wanted to know uh, what kind of steps has the district taken to uh, improve efficiency and reduce costs? 
It's a, it's a very valid question. I, I go back three years ago to the question, Jane, that you asked, you know, why should we throw good money after bad money? And so that's haunted me for three years, thank you. And, uh, but um, we have done a lot of things around the area of, of efficiency. We reduced our budget by $50 million just a bit over a year ago. We've eliminated and trimmed a lot of our existing programs. We went through a pro forma process where we looked at, was there a measurable effect size as a result of implementing that program? And was it sustainable and even scalable? and where it wasn't, we began to reduce those programs and found opportunities to reinvest in programs where we do get an effect size, like Boys and Girls Club. We closed um, four underutilized buildings that year, not a popular decision, but the right decision, saving us approximately $8.9 million a year. We sold unneeded properties that year to the tune of earning about $6 million off the income. We began leasing more properties, so we earn close to a million dollars on leases each year. We decreased workman's compensation. I could go on on the list, but we've taken that very seriously to make certain, in many of our board members' words, that we've turned over every rock um, to see where there was opportunity to um, either delay or make smaller the ask of our community for additional revenue. Uh, very specifically, several people have asked about are there unused buildings that the district uh, could sell? Thank you. There, there, are, there are unused buildings, and the district is in a process now of evaluating um, 13 different pieces of real estate that we brought to the board um, for um, the, the possible declaration as surplus and then ultimately to go through the process to make available to the public. Um, on Thursday, September 8th at Downtown High School, um, there'll actually be a presentation around those 13 buildings and for the community to give input into do they see other uses, um, do they oppose the, the, you know, the declaring of those surplus. Then on the 13th, our Neighborhood School Development Partnership Committee, which is a committee of the board, will take a look at that input from the community and that Neighborhood School Development Partnership um, committee will make a recommendation to the board and the board has indicated they will take action on September 20th. And so because they're my boss, I better let you know who the board are so the board could like raise their hands so that they could be recognized they're here today too, so. Okay. Yay. I believe we have all seven members of the board here today. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca, you talked about the services that you provide in the schools. How do you measure uh, if there's an impact with the children? Yeah, so there's uh, a few different ways that we measure impact. Um, and, and in impact, I'm talking really about more kind of short-term indicators. Outcomes for us tend to be, you know, 5, 10, 15 uh, your journeys. Um, so first and foremost, when we're working with children, we measure something that we call the optimal club experience. Um, because we know that when kids are in a space where they feel safe, where they feel valued, where they have strong relationships with adults, um, they're going to have better outcomes. So that's one thing that we measure in the short and the long term and how we're delivering on that. When it comes to academics, we've actually turned a lot of our focus to summer and summer learning loss. Um, because we find that that's where there are few resources in the community, you know, relatively speaking, uh, at least in the out of school time space, um, and it's where we can have a huge impact. So over the past three years, we've been, been measuring summer learning loss. Um, and um, among the club members who participate in the program who are students in Columbus City Schools, uh, we've had a three year average of 87% of young people experiencing no summer learning loss or experiencing a gain. Um, and typically, uh, the average student in a, a low-income neighborhood would be experiencing three months of loss. So when it comes to measuring academics, we've really put a lot more of our resources there. Um, and then finally, we're um, really just starting to do this, but employing um, social emotional learning uh, measures like the DESA and the DESA Mini, which we've done with our partners at Future Ready, um, but really looking at how are our kids doing um, socially and, and emotionally, because we know that that has a big impact on their performance in the classroom and on the classroom environment. And that's where we have, you know, we're serving kids till 8 p.m. every day, um, weekends, all day during the summer, and we just have much more of an opportunity to impact that um, because really the schools have a lot of work to do academically. Rhonda, you have been with Columbus Schools for a long time. Yes, uh, a long, long have, time. Have things changed? <laughs> Have the students changed? Is there a difference today than there would have been when you began? 
Well, I started, you know, at the, the beginning of time, which was 1978, as a teacher at Northwest Career Center. And at that time, um, the district had over 100,000 students, and most of the students were not living in poverty. Um, a, a lot of things have changed over the years, and so the jobs f teachers have is just really tough, and they need the supports um, outside of the classroom to be successful inside the classroom. You know, our students come to us and they're hungry and they're in trauma and they can't get to school every day and we know that they can't learn if they're not in school and oftentimes they're not in school because of the non-academic barriers that they face trying to get to school. I'll give you an example. We have a fifth grader in an elementary school who's responsible for getting his second grade sister to school every day. So if the fifth grader is sick, the second grader stays home. Or if the second grader is sick, the fifth grader has to stay home and take care of the kid. We have to help families to, to m remove those barriers so that they can get to school every day. You know, we have students in our schools who are, who are medically fragile, and so the addition of school nurses is going to help significantly with this. Oftentimes, our students don't see doctors, they see the, the school nurse. Oftentimes our staffs actually see the school nurse as well. So um, school nurses are my, my favorite group of all in the, in the Columbus City School District. Um, but also, um, uh, over the years, what I've seen is the, the same, while we've had a, a really good rebuilding program, there are some schools that were there in 1978 and before, and they're still there. And so teachers are working in conditions that are not what they should be. Uh, everybody deserves to work in a warm, safe, dry, sometimes cool environment. Um, I remember um, before a building project, Old oh, Orchard, I, I got called to a classroom because there was a tarp in a classroom that kept the, the, the water from getting on the kids by draining the, draining the water into buckets around the kids. Um, so, so things have changed, but some things that needed to be changed haven't been changed yet. So our, our families face um, a, a lot, um, a lot of non-academic barriers. I think that this, the levy. If you look at the list, and I want to thank you, Mark, and thank you, Kids Ohio, for explaining um, the, the the staffing increases and the work done. I think it's very clear here of what you've laid out to help us as we move from that the the, the students of 1978 to the the students that. That we have in our schools today. Dr. Good, uh, Rhonda just talked about the, the physical condition of some of the buildings. And I know the district has had a very ambitious facility initiative, the large committee. Uh, where do things stand with the facility issue at this point? Thank you. So um, yes, the, the facility master plan has been updated. Um, and th this was the work of an ad hoc committee of the Neighborhood School Development Partnership, the committee I spoke of of the board, and it was a very inclusive process, an iterative process that occurred over a six-month period of time where they looked at all the educational sites of the district because we have other holdings that are not necessarily used as schools and um, evaluated based upon our enrollment projections and the needs of our anticipated students whether in fact we would continue uh, to need all of those uh, pieces of real estate and whether in fact they were um, of such condition that they could be renovated or whether they would need to be torn down and, and, and built new um, if we should change um, uh, attendance areas and change feeder patterns. It was a very uh, ambitious effort. And in the end, the facility plan has been updated. Where, where we got to in the last two meetings, though, that we're just a little more than a week apart um, late in the process, was thinking about possibilities relative to secondary education and really having conversations about the merits of mega high schools versus neighborhood high schools. And not that one is preferable over another from an from a, a educational perspective, perspective, um, but it was just the beginning of that conversation, and I think the committee wisely, under the leadership of Shauna Gibbs and Donna Peretti, board chairs, co-chairs, um, 
uh, agreed that we should reconvene at a later time to begin to look at that more comprehensively. So um, at this point, the report has been updated. Um, there is a plan to do a segment uh, 3, B, and C, sections 1, 2, and 3 um, at some point in the future, but that really only addresses one high school and several elementaries and a couple of middle schools, but we still need to have that conversation about the secondaries. Mm -hmm. the, uh, there's uh, maybe as a follow-up question to that, <clears throat> if this levy were to pass, how would the district hold itself accountable for results? And, and, and thank you, it's a great question. I think that's one of the major improvements we've made. If, if you were to ask me of areas where we've really made progress, it's in the areas of achievement, which I outlined in my remarks, um, but also in the areas of integrity. Um, we, we, we do have data validation now. We do have reliable data. We do have a fidelity in our processes for collecting and extracting that data and using it. We have budget and fiscal accountability now. Um, I talked about the pro formas and how we're using trend data now to make those projections and how we have additional board committees, the finance advisory committee. We have our audit and accountability committee. We've had a, um, a, a millage committee, other committees, a, a, a policy review committee. Um, there's much more transparency to what we do. And so in former districts where we already had the luxury of that, we would actually put report cards online. This is what we promised to do with the new revenue. Here's what you can inspect as an outcome, hold us accountable, and we would keep that live. So we actually now have several digital dashboards. We have one that addresses enrollment, and you can slice and dice that any way you like to see if the demography and how students are identified and where they exist. Um, we have one now for our, our finances. So um, actually there are two. There's the state treasurer and then also our own that um, we've published so you can see to whom checks are written and how many times they've gotten checks and where the money's coming in. But I think the same sort of dashboard um, opportunity exists relative to this levy. We can publish exactly how many of those positions I described we'd be hiring each of those years and where they would be placed and what you could anticipate in terms of outcomes and learning and um, keeping them in school. Rhonda, you uh, follow what the school board does uh, very closely. How does the new budget process compare to what the district had been doing previously? Well, I'd like to begin by thanking um, board member Mary Jo Hudson for leading the finance committee and the audit and accountability committee. And I, I would describe the process as open, transparent, and thoughtful. Um, in the past, the budget was determined by the administration and as a teacher and even as a union leader, I didn't always see how the, the, the board got to the number for their budget. I didn't know, but this process is so open. Actually, I mean, it is so open and um, so thoughtful and all of the administrators present and they have to defend the expenditures for all of their departments. That is totally different. And now the community is aware of the whole budgeting process. It isn't just a number and one page, hand it to the board to vote on and say, this is our budget, this is our resolution. But there's so much work beyond that. And I appreciate having that transparency. If I, if I had been, uh, if I were the union president now, uh, I would be very pleased about having this open process so when I went to bargaining, I would know exactly what your numbers are. And the other thing too is, <laughs> the other thing too though is that it actually matches the five-year forecast. And that is different and that's exactly what it should be. And the way they do the budget now, it isn't, here's our, here's our final number and what do we cut to make this work? it is much more thoughtful than it has ever been. So I wanna thank the board, I wanna thank Mary Jo for, for a, a, a great process here. Dr. Good, in your experience, uh, you've been the superintendent of three different districts. How does the Columbus budget process uh, compare? Um, I, I would say now we're on par, if not ahead, of, of the other two districts where I had the opportunity to serve. I would say that was not the case when I came to the district. As uh, Rhonda indicated, it was a one-page budget. Now it's a 900-page budget, and it is a much more, as we began that process for next year's budget already, 
and um, it's, it's iterative, which I think is so important so that the community has an opportunity to provide feedback and give direction to us because we do serve the community. And um, ultimately, I think it's one that the community can stand behind and know we're investing efficiently um, with an eye toward effectiveness. And um, I think that speaks to the accountability and the transparency you mentioned. I want to give the audience a heads up. In a few minutes, we're going to begin questions. Uh, so think of thoughtful questions that uh, that you can pose to any member of the panel, and we'll announce that in just a moment, but give you a chance to, to think about that. Um, one question, Dr. Good, that comes up all the time is, uh, if this levy were not to be approved by the voters, what would be the consequences for the district? So, so it's, it's a question I, I've pondered a lot, and I've not gone through the process yet of beginning to identify where we would make reductions, because just like building a budget to deconstruct a budget, it would have to be a collaborative, iterative process as well. Um, this will actually be one of the first levies where we look at what we can do to build on our successes um, that we've already demonstrated to the community versus a levy where you're threatening your community. If you don't pass this, we're going to have to reduce that. And I think it's a good position for Columbus to finally be in to say we know um, how to teach children reading. We know that pre-kindergarten, high-quality pre-kindergarten experiences work. We know where we have buildings where we need to invest so that we can keep them in service for a longer period of time until ultimately um, our facility master plan is implemented. Um, so we've not gone through the process of, of what um, we would reduce. Um, but because we went through that process three years ago, looking at every program and the effect size, and again, its scalability, sustainability, and the return on investment, I, I can stand, sit here confidently and say there's not much left to reduce before we begin to cut into um, um, primary services for our students. If I could just mark um, one thing I think is important for everybody to think about. Um, what. Dr. Good is talking about is building capacity in this community. And the challenges that young people in this community are facing are great. And it's harder than ever today for young people to overcome these challenges, uh, you know, mostly because of factors that are totally outside of their control. Communities are addressing this, but it's the consistent factor across communities is that they're investing. And we ha are dealing with one to two generations of, of problems and challenges and issues. And it's gonna take us another generation uh, to start moving forward. So I, I just encourage the community to be patient and to think about capacity. Because we're not just thinking about the children that we're serving today. The youth population in this community is gonna grow by 35% in the next 20 years. Mm -hmm. And where do we want to be? Do we want to be ready to address these problems, or do we want to be, you know, continuing to, to be in a catch-up mode? Um, and so I think that that's so important. And, and I love that it's not about threatening what we're going to cut, but it's about what we're going to build. And our young people need so much more today than ever. Uh, and, and so they need you to invest. They need you to build upon what they have access to and, and the opportunities that they have currently. And if I may, I'm going to piggyback on that. Thank you so much. You've just become our campaign chair. So that, um, I think, too, we need to recognize that children are the symptoms of a larger issue we need to address. And there are so many organizations, Impact, Future Ready Columbus, United Way, Thrive, that recognize we have to have linkage coordinators or caseworkers essentially supporting our families and lifting them up and making certain they have those services available to them because as Rebecca said, we have them about five and a half hours a day. And so they oftentimes go back to an environment that only reinforces that toxic stress circuitry of their brain. It's actually a physiolog physiological phenomenon we need to think about. And so how do we re recircuit the brain so that it responds in positive ways to some of those stressors and some and and so that requires working with the whole family when we went door to door last weekend in Linden Park knocking on doors inviting people to send their four-year-olds I can't even begin to tell you how many homes we went to where we found for example the first home we went to a 16 year old living alone um, who enrolls at West because of the, the relationship, the social situation in the neighborhood where he currently resides. His mother died a year, a year and a half ago. His brother was killed at gunpoint four years ago. And I'm thinking, how, how does this young man make it? 
Um, and but this is what this is what's happening in our community, and we have to recognize that we need to reach in and find ways to show the families that are raising our children, those extended families, and the faith <coughs> institutions that are supporting them. How, how do we how do we provide them pathways to prosperity as well? It's not just the student. We can't continue to think of the student as the unit of change. It has to be the family as the unit of change. At this point, I uh, just want to remind you that it's the uh, Columbus Metropolitan Club's tradition to take audience uh, questions. Please state your name, ask your question, and we thank you in advance for not making long editorial comments. Uh, so the microphone is over here, and as people are coming up, let me pose a question to the panel, if I may, may and that is, uh, about 15% of students in the Columbus schools are new Americans. They have arrived here from countries as diverse as, as uh, Bhutan, uh, f from Costa Rica, f from Somalia, from Kenya. Uh, how, how are the schools addressing the needs of these students? And any of you can start. So thank you, it's a good question. And, and just to put a little context to that, so we have 116 nationalities represented in our schools. We speak 106 first languages in the district. I speak all of them fluently, so <laughs> <laughs> not even. Um, so one of the things we've done is work toward integrating students back into their neighborhood schools more quickly. It used to be they could go to a school called Global Academy, which was a high school and had its own uh, number and its own grade card. Um, but we, through working with U.S. Department of Education, we recognize it's more important that they acquire English quickly and then be mainstreamed or integrated back into their neighborhood schools. So what that requires is that we develop a full continuum of services in every building, much like we do for our students identified with disabilities, now what we do for our students identified as gifted, where you could have someone that just occasionally consults with the student to help increase their understanding and their assimilation of new knowledge. You could have someone that just consults with the teacher. The student could go out part of the day into a classroom where they get instruction or they could go out a full day in that building or they could go to a completely satellite site to get the deeper intervention required but now we need to have that full continuum of services available in all quadrants of the city it's one of the outcomes of the facility master plan ad hoc's work they were adamant that we should have those available in all of our neighborhoods that we shouldn't just rely on one site to provide that sort of service to our children and so we've expanded that obviously for not only our limited English learning but our students with identified as gifted and talented and then also our students with disabilities. Very good. How about if we let the audience members uh, please tell us who you are? Hi. Um, I'm Karina Brown with Columbus State. Um, I'm also a founding board member of Clinton Vogel Public and I have two children in the district. And I just have a couple of questions just for clarification so I can fully understand. Um, in the operating levy of the staffing. Does it include some of the suggestions, and I, mean, I completely agree with pre-K and the extension needed for summer. Um, does this, so I have two questions, does this include a summer option for all Columbus City School students? And Dr. Good, thank you for providing this information, and I completely agree in terms of the limited amount of time our students actually have for instruction, considering that, you know, physical education, the arts, um, clear career exploration is also really important. I'm wondering if this partnership and collaboration that we're seeing today with the Boys and Girls Club will also extend to after school opportunities like KIPP, the Boys and Girls Club offer robust after school programs to allow for increased remediation and acceleration for students who wish to stay in their neighborhood. So, two questions. Hi, Karina, how are you? <laughs> um, and Karina and I were, were working on, on some of these options. So actually in about six weeks, um, some staff from Boys and Girls Clubs and some staff from Columbus City Schools, but also some of our other partners in the community are invited. We're one of 50 cities in the country that Boys and Girls Clubs of America is bringing together to do some planning around this. Um, our biggest well, you know, I don't want to say our biggest. There's a lot of challenges. We know we need to grow capacity. Um, and I think, you know, our desire is to grow capacity uh, really quickly and in an urgent way. Um, but sometimes that can prevent challenges. Um, so I know, you know, what we've been working on is, okay, this has worked well. We want to do more of it next year. Um, and, and really planning very 
thoughtfully. Um, so we know today, while every elementary school student has the option for summer, it's not necessarily in their neighborhood, depending on, on where they are. Um, so we are working on it. Funding is a big piece of it. Um, our county's been really generous in, in investing um, in this, and I, I think it's just going to be you know, a process that will take us time to plan, time to bring the right partners to the table, time to align the right sustainable sources of funding um, so we can really do this in the right way. So, um, you know, again, that's why investments like this are so important because a school district cannot begin to think about, okay, how do we expand the hours in the summer, um, you know, if, if there are concerns about just how do we get kids through the school day and do the basics of what we need to do? And, and I think the other piece of that is um, wh what I learned really during my first year is there is no panacea, no silver bullet. The solutions have to be customized to neighborhoods. And even in some neighborhoods, street by street, um, the, the needs are very different. So we learned REAB works well. Um, on, on, you know, the REAB Center works well where it is. But the Marion Franklin Opportunity Center, which was much more organic and more raw, works very well for that community and addresses a very different set of needs that were expressed by the Civic Center and the, the residents in that neighborhood. The same as we're learning from the Linden Park um, Early Childhood Education Neighborhood Center. And we're looking on the west side now, too, at a building and the needs of um, uh, a high percentage of limited English speakers, both Somali and Latino, and um, how we can partner with the Guadalupe Center and G put GED programs and work skills training programs so we can get diversify our safety services in the city. So it has to be very customized to neighborhood in order for people to invest and then own and then grow those programs and sustain them um, because absolutely we, we don't have that unlimited resource. We currently, Karina, have resources to expand summer school. In fact, most people probably don't realize that we ran a second summer school this year because we were so concerned that some of our third graders had not returned for those intervention opportunities. We did a boot camp over the last eight days, and so tomorrow is the last day of boot camp, I believe. And again, we went door to door. So we do have resources to expand, but again, of the over 200 students, or almost 200 students that we targeted, we averaged 46 that attended each day. So we have to also had to be judicious how we expend, but there are neighborhoods, such as the neighborhood where you live, that I think would embrace that, and it would be a good return on investment. Good afternoon. I'm Kathy Fox with the Pizzuti Companies. Um, more importantly, my husband has been volunteering at the Reeb Avenue Center with the Boys and Girls Clubs for your summer program. Um, my question has to do with the investment that the community has already made in facilities with Columbus Public Schools and how you are um, either currently or in the future training your facility staff to take care of all these new buildings and new systems that are different technology than the buildings that uh, were being replaced? It's such a great question, and I have a secret weapon. His name is Maurice Oldham. We found him at, <laughs> he used to work at, I think it was a, at Duke, one of the university hospital systems there. Um, the man has systems since. Um, he, he is the one that actually identified that we didn't have um, ongoing preventive maintenance cycles in place in the district, which is one of the reasons we're asking for that half mill um, permanent continuous improvement levy um, to support implementation of those cycles and replacements so that the district will never again find itself in a position where they're faced with $200 million in deferred maintenance. That should never have occurred. It occurred for one reason or another, um, but Maurice has been dogmatic about looking at all the different um, business and operations centers in, in our organization, and um, he's brought in some others I, I won't name all of them, but many of them are here today. Thank you all for the work that you're doing. But I'd be very pleased to sit down and actually show you, and I know Maurice would too, uh, would be pleased to show you how we're developing both the capacity and implementing those replacement repair cycles so, so that we're not in the same position in, in four years again. Hi. My name is Jill Levy. I'm a community volunteer. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you all for all the information that I'm hearing today that I haven't heard or read about in terms of the programs that you've done. The however that I have is that I feel the burden of, of being a home-owning taxpayer is unfair, and it's hard for me to get behind this kind of levy. However, I will tell you, as a retiree, I will volunteer my time at any Columbus public school 
Uh, and I have a feeling that many, many people here who are also retirees would do the same. So you have a workforce that is willing to work for you. Thank you. Thank you. And, and we are very, very grateful um, for that workforce. There are many volunteers in our schools now, as I indicated at one of our high schools where those volunteers agreed to be mentors. We actually tripled the percentage of students that were able to cross the stage in just a four month period of time. And these are students that weren't just like a half credit short. They had missing school, missing volunteer hours, missing multiple credits. But those individuals such as yourself and, and well-meaning persons that maybe that's the only resource they can give found a way to contribute to our city's well-being and the families that live here. So we thank you for that. And um, I will tell you that it's been a, a long battle to address the way schools are funded in Ohio. I wish I could tell you there's light at the end of the tunnel, but I think Stan Bohoric, our treasurer CFO, would agree that um, we'll probably be continuing that conversation for the next decade. Well, and if I could, because, you know, what I heard from that was, you know, wow, it's really hard to be asked to give of my own financial resources for something that doesn't necessarily impact me directly or impact my family directly. Um, you know, and while certainly there could be questions about the school funding model, this is what it is. And, and I can't tell you, I mean, this, this summer, I've worked for Boys and Girls Clubs for a really long time, uh, or, you know, eight years, I guess maybe it's not that long, but <laughs> to me. Um, this summer has been one of the most challenging summers for our staff from children who live in cars, to children who are abandoned, to children who live with heroin addicts, to children who are abused terribly every single day. And, and I don't say that to be depressing, but, but there is hope because I know kids that lived in that situation and today they're going to college and today um, you know, they're working and, and doing great things. And it's because they were able to go to a good school and had teachers who supported them. It's because they were at a place like a club. It's because they had access to resources. And, and so although it's hard, our kids need you. It's our future, and let's be one of the first communities in this country to invest more in our future than we do in what's happened in the past or what's happening today. And, and so I just say that, you know, as, and, and it makes me emotional to talk about it, but, but our kids need you. And, and they need you as volunteers, they need you as investors, they need you as advocates, they need it all. And, and it can't just be one thing or the other. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I thank you for that because I know it's hard and it's hard to sacrifice, but it's, it's what we need and the sacrifice is worth it. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, and you know you can write in a candidate on the presidential ballot, so the spelling is A-S-M-O. <laughs> Hello, uh, I'm, I'm Katie Luna Hookway. Uh, I am also with Clintonville Go Public, but uh, in my, my day job, I work for the Ohio Office of Budget and Management. And so uh, I was hoping you could walk through this millage primer a little bit, because uh, a couple questions I had, right? So you have the staffing and operating levy, and then the deferred maintenance bond issue, and the permanent improvement levy. Okay, permanent, we're kind of voting for this to be ongoing forever. Um, but the other ones, is, it, is there like a timeline on the staffing and operating? And then talking about the deferred maintenance bond issue, are we talking, are we paying the debt service back on bonds? Because right now we're at historic lows. Everyone knows they're not earning any interest on anything, but you know, we're not paying interest either when we borrow money to invest in schools. So that's something I, you know, want some, I wish I could clearly explain to other people because I work in a budget office, I don't always, school funding is very complicated. So uh, that's why, I hope that I can understand this better from leaving here today. Uh, this is a very valid question, but we're we're at 119, and I just uh, we're gonna the panel has agreed to stay to answer your question and also answer. But I want to take one last question. Okay, that's a very valid question, and we'll get uh, staff to help here. But uh, it, go ahead. Well, this will be our last question. Thanks for the enthusiasm. It's just. We want to respect uh, people who've made plans to get back to their uh, offices. Um, 
Um, hi, um, my name is Bianca, and I am a Denison student, and I am interning for the Human Services Chamber of Franklin County. Um, I heard um, Daniel Good say that um, family is the unit of change and not necessarily the student itself. So I was going to ask, um, how would you vision that change, and how would the Columbus Public um, City Schools um, be a contributing factor towards it? Thank so, you. Thank you so much. What a great question. And I think as a community, it's really a social policy issue for us. We've had a lot of conversation, Lily and Lowry and I have, um, Janet Jackson and I have, um, both children and I have, uh, that, that we really need to begin to think about that whole hub model and how are we identifying what needs to, what needs need to be addressed in, in each school, in each neighborhood, on each street, and how are we aligning them, the resources, and connecting them to those families. Again, the students may be the conduit to accessing families so that we can begin to have those conversations and make those linkages, but it's really a community issue. If you look at the work that PAC's doing, the Partners Achieving Community transformation, it's very much the basis of their model. It's very much the basis of the Promise Neighborhoods model, where we're beginning to align and be more efficient with those resources and place them where they're needed and stop tripping over each other in terms of providing the same things. Not everyone needs mittens, and so there are institutions that do that very well, and that should be the niche they carve out. But there are others where Mid Ohio Food Bank needs to step in. There are others where the, the health department needs to step in, others where community housing needs to step in. But it's that whole hub model and how we provide those linkages based upon what the needs are, and the city schools obviously need to be at the table for the educational arm of that. Well, thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time today. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed today's forum. We encourage you to continue the conversation with coffee and cookies, and of course, as they just mentioned, perhaps the board, the panelists are going to stay for a moment. Um, and answer a few more questions. Uh, you can view and share today's forum and all of our forums on CTV Columbus Television on WSU and PBS affiliates statewide through the Ohio Channel and anytime on CMC's website via YouTube. Please thank our sponsor today, the Columbus Foundation and Ice Miller, and thank you to our speakers, Rhonda Johnson, Rebecca Asmo, Dan Good, and Mark Reel. And thanks to all of you for being here. Have a good afternoon.